I've been doing all these Zooms. I don't know what happened, but um, thanks for your patience and let's, uh, let's jump in. Uh, as the, uh, uh, so the topic is AI risk management framework and what, what it is and why we are doing this. Uh, let me first start by giving a very short high level overview of uh, NIST, who we are and what we do. Uh, as the federal laboratory uh, with a mission solely focused on uh, advancing uh, economic security and uh, innovation uh, across uh, industry in the US. NIST has a very broad portfolio of research uh, and uh, uh, from, from AI to quantum information sciences to uh, advanced communications to smart manufacturing. Uh, it uh, has six research laboratory and the lab information technology laboratory that I'm from is one of those six research laboratory. Um, and uh, all of our uh, scientists across the different uh, uh, labs at NIST uh, on the research, uh, scientific research that they're doing, they're using AI as uh, a scientific discovery tool uh, to do whatever research they're doing better. But at ITL, we are mostly focused on foundational research on AI. Uh, NIST also has a very long uh, standing tradition of cultivating trust in technologies. And we do that by participating in uh, development of standards uh, in advancing measurement science, standards and measurement science that makes technologies more reliable, more accurate, more secure, more private, um, more fair, in other words, more trustworthy. And we all agree, as uh, Susan was saying at the top of this call, uh, this is really important in the space of AI, uh, given uh, its, uh, um, you know, enormous potential to uh, impact our life in, in uh, really positive ways uh, and its widespread impact at, at all the different aspects of life that we can have. So at NIST, uh, directed by a congressional mandate, uh, we launched a open, transparent, uh, collaborative process for development of an AI risk management framework, a voluntary framework uh, that uh, for managing risks of AI in a flexible, structured, and measurable way. Uh, flexible because uh, it, a, it allows for innovation. Uh, we all know that this, uh, this uh, area is fast moving uh, and um, also flexible so organizations of different sizes can uh, adopt this. Um, uh, structured in a way that I, I will talk a little bit more about this, in a way that provide a taxonomy, a, uh, a structured way of thinking about risk measuring and managing risk, and measurable because if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Uh, so uh, having discussions around uh, what to measure and how to measure is very central into the AI RMF. It takes a, a rights preserving approach uh, and it tries to address the traditional measures of accuracy, robustness, and reliability, but also the socio-technical aspects of AI systems. We all agree that AI systems are, are all about context and they're, um, they're, they are not just about data computation and algorithm, and uh, they are a, a, a complex uh, uh, interaction of uh, algorithm, data, uh, systems, uh, environment, and human. Uh, so characteristics such as um, fairness and uh, bias, uh, managed uh, privacy, uh, uh, safety, uh, there are explainability and interpretability. These are all characteristics that are very much um, tied by human behaviors. Um, so what does AI RMF uh, do in two parts? In part one, it tries to uh, provide a terminology and taxonomy for AI risks, for what we mean by trust, trustworthy systems, what are characteristics that we wanna see in a system to be trustworthy. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it provides these characteristics of valid and reliable, uh, safe, uh, secure and resilient, interpretable and explainable, uh, privacy enhanced, fair bias managed, accountable and transparent um, for a system to be uh, trustworthy. It also lays out uh, some challenges for risk understanding and risk management in part one. The part two 
focuses on uh, a, a guidelines and a, a suggested actions for uh, understanding, identifying, and um, measuring and managing AI risks. Uh, these uh, suggestions are categorized into four functions of govern, map, measure, and manage. Uh, during the map, it provides guidance on identifying context, identifying risks, identifying who is impacted, uh, um, uh, and uh, the measure function focus on measuring the risks identified in the map function and uh, manage function use those informations uh, for uh, uh, treating and addressing the risk identified, which can go anywhere from accepting risk to sharing, to transferring, to mitigations, uh, all the way to decisions about uh, decommissioning the system or stopping the project altogether. We say everything starts with governance and ends with governance. All these functions are in the sea of the governance. The governance uh, uh, talks about the roles and responsibilities, the policies and procedures uh, that ought to be uh, uh, in place for an effective risk management. So to wrap all of these things up and uh, giving you a very, uh, you know, high level end goal of where AI or MF is, we don't want it to be a checklist. We don't want it to be a list of things that ought to be done to just check and say, okay, by doing this, my system is now trustworthy. But it's uh, it's a attempt on changing the culture of thinking about risks, thinking about impact, thinking about who is gonna be impacted by how much, who is gonna be left out as part of the conversations at every stages of the AI life cycle. At the end, what we're trying to do is making that uh, making sure that uh, technologies, and particularly in this case, AI technology, operationalize values, starting with the values in our society, but different organizations have different values too, that they want to be reflected in the product and services that they provide. And by doing all this, increasing public uh, confidence and trust in this type of products and services in AI technologies, so we can all uh, benefit from the um, uh, promises and potentials of AI technology and uh, while minimizing its risks. So uh, that's a, that's a, a kind of, a, a, you know, I don't know, seven minutes or so descriptions of the AI RMF and I'm looking forward to the questions and I'm hoping that we make it more discussion and conversations rather than I speaking and talking with you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for that overview. We really appreciate it. And what's the name of the puppy behind you? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's that's Rainier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, so let me ask a few questions while I encourage um, our audience to put their questions in the chat. And we, we want to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I wanted to just be a selfish person and ask two. Um, that are irrelevant to my own work. I said irrelevant, but I'm just really curious about them. And the first one is, um, in terms, of, there's very little in the risk management framework about data and about um, uh, data provenance. And this kind of worries me. And I wondered, um, you know, given the, you know, so much of AI development and risk lies in the business model, um, uh, so much research is done by the private sector. Does the framework, in your mind, incentivize designers and developers to record and disclose data provenance? Yeah, excellent question. And thank you very much for that question. Uh, obviously, data is a really important part of this, and data provenance, data governance, really important part of any type of risk management. Uh, one of the, the uh, early uh, sort of a design uh, decisions that was made. And uh, I just want to also say this, that when I say decisions was made or we did this, this we here is a collective NIST and uh, the whole community that contributed in development of the AI RMF. And maybe I just say a few things that uh, the development process uh, started with a request for information, uh, uh, three rounds of uh, draft, one concept paper and two drafts for public comment, three rounds of uh, workshops and numerous listening sessions. Uh, along the way, we heard from more than 240 organizations, uh, received uh, more than 400 sets of comments. All the comments and recording of the workshops are posted on our website. 
in in early stages, uh, one of the things that we uh, again we collectively with the community decided that for the there isn't a shortage of um, a high level value based documents for AI strategy and trustworthy responsible AI around the globe, uh, but also uh, frameworks and uh, uh, risk management frameworks and documents for managing uh, risks of uh, you know software systems uh, or in broadly information technology systems. One of the decisions that we made is that in development of this document, we will focus on risks that are unique to AI system um, because because AI systems, you know, risk to AI system is no different than the risks to other information technology or software systems. So the data stuff that you mentioned, absolutely applicable here, but instead of really focusing on just the data as data, we suggest leveraging other frameworks that are, exist for the data, including NIST's uh, uh, secure software development uh, uh, framework that talk, touches about data and also some other frameworks or cybersecurity framework or privacy framework and uh, be able to uh, have a more uh, focus on risks unique to AI. Uh, one of the appendices talks about some of the risk, you know, how AI risks are different from other traditional software risks. Um, and then also say that uh, in the map measure and manage function, maybe also in the govern function, there are subcategories that talk about data and data governance um, and the playbook, uh, which I didn't mention in my uh, overview, we also provide some companion document uh, that try to get into more uh, prescriptive, descriptive, uh, I shouldn't say prescriptive, really descriptive um, information that's are needed in implementations or adoption of the AI RMF. So in, um, in uh, more description around uh, when the data and data governance has been mentioned, for example, data sheets for data sets and similar work has been referenced as informative references for uh, helping with the data. Uh, but Susan, what you said, all of them is correct. What we were trying to do is giving some general technology agnostic, sector agnostic framework, but strong enough foundation that all these vertical could be built open and if you had a chance to look at the roadmap that we uh, uh, put out as, uh, as a glimpse of the uh, important activities that ought to be done in, uh, to, uh, to help with operationalizing and implementation of the AIR RMF, development of the profiles is part of that, which, uh, which in a way um, can address the issue of the data and data governance for um, specific uh, use cases. Got it. Thank you for your answer. Um, so in doing, you know, lots of groups have been doing mappings of AI principles, standards, agreements. As I said earlier, just, just today, the EU came out with a new one with Singapore. Um, and these have different definitions, objectives, and strategies. Do you think, and in some ways, this is probably an unfair question because you're the author of the risk management framework, but um, you know, accountability has been lacking. A risk manager framework gives you a way to do that. But is that, do you think you can find consensus on it? Uh, like what you showed in the crosswalk? Yeah, that's another excellent question, right? Uh, and, and you mentioned the crosswalks and crosswalks uh, is an attempt to uh, provide more semantic semantic alignment across these uh, these documents. Another design document, again, early on decided uh, by, by input from the community was that uh, we don't want a document, yet another document that either says things in a different way or worse contradict the things that are in other documents. So alignment and understanding and again, uh, leveraging this stuff that are out there was something that was part of our design goal. Uh, you may see that in the document, to the extent possible, we have leveraged definitions from OECD or ISO documents, and then we uh, we put some crosswalk out uh, as sort of a, you know, there, there are a lot more crosswalk to come. One of those crosswalks that was first introduced in the second, uh, in the first draft was crosswalk to the other policy document. So you see the proposed EU AI Act is there, 
And through the Trade and Technology Council, we have had several conversations with our uh, European partner, particularly uh, some of you may tracking the, uh, uh, the joint AI roadmap that was part of the deliverable of the last uh, TTC ministerial meeting posted on uh, the meeting was December 4, the joint draft Joint, joint roadmap was delivered at that time, uh, all uh, aiming towards um, understanding how these approaches are different and uh, bringing these approaches closer together. So for some of you guys had, that had seen the TTC joint AI roadmap, it uh, um, uh, recommend uh, establishment of uh, three working groups that uh, uh, one of them focuses on terms and te uh, terminology, even terms such as risk and harm and all of those, uh, and then uh, focus on um, contribution towards international standards because it's my personal belief that regardless of policy and regulatory landscape, good uh, scientifically valid, clear implementable international standard is a grounding uh, basis for any regulatory and policy, right? You know, if you look at the proposed EU AI Act talks about compliance to a set of specifications. Those specifications are basically can be specifications in standards uh, or international standards. So uh, uh, I just summarized by saying that uh, at least in US and EU uh, and across the globe, risk-based approach resonate. Um, uh, there is a lot of uh, um, support for risk-based approach. Um, but our risk-based approaches are not exactly the same as it was uh, mentioned through the TTC uh, and some of the work that we're doing. Uh, for example, uh, we here in the US believe that one size fits all, one size does not fit all and uh, uh, every uh, AI is all about context and every context is every use case uh, uh, demands and uh, requires its own risk management uh, effort and activity. Thank you so much for that answer. I want to open it up to the questions we have on the floor. So I'm going to read them in the interest of time. Was the collaboration to generate this framework multi-stakeholder in nature? And you already yes, answered that. Um, yes, yes, yes. And, we, and had, we had participation from academia, industry, standard development organizations, uh, internet, you know, globally, different governments, uh, uh, the list of comments and commenters on our website, if you like to see, Vivi. Yeah, but those are traditional audiences that comment on these things. And um, ironically, we have a study coming out of public participation in AI strategies, and we found governments didn't do very much to market these kind of things. So the broader public doesn't participate, which is true of policy. Do you, what do you think governments can do or organizations such as NIST can do to get a broader public perspective, which might allow it to be more anticipatory of problems? Yeah, uh, yeah another really good, good question. So one of the things that we did, we, we also tried to do listening sessions. So going to, uh, uh, you know, different entities reach out to us for doing listening sessions or we reach out to them uh, uh, as our hope to reach out a broader, uh, a broader, um, you know, community. But uh, I, I want to extrapolate and uh, broadening the question that you ask. Um, getting public engagement in um, in that in this type of activities and hearing from individuals, which we did, we heard from individuals. Not that you know, some of those comments came from individuals. But how to do this more? Um, systematically and broader rather than just put it put a federal register notice out and hope people uh, uh, will join. And that question becomes even more important when we are talking about understanding impact and hearing from impacted community when we are doing uh, risk management. So um, a lot of uh, really smart people are thinking about inclusive design, participatory engagement, and that's one activity that we are uh, planning to uh, uh, to build the community around and work with the community to come up with a better way of doing that. Thank you so much. Our next question is, was this 
uh, excuse me, is NIST doing any work regarding federated learning AI architectures in terms of a trustworthy kind of analysis? Um, okay. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, I don't know how to answer quickly, uh, answer this. Federated learning and research around federated learning and uh, utility of federated learning for, for example, privacy enhanced technologies um, or, or are being studied. Some of you may know that um, uh, US and UK are administering a uh, price challenge on privacy enhanced technologies, uh, uh, kind of inviting the community to leverage methods such as federated learning on building AI models that are more privacy enhanced. Uh, from US side, NIST, NSF, and OSTP are running this. Uh, so those type of activity are going on. Um, uh, but in terms of it, so you, you said in terms of trustworthy kind of analysis, um, if you had a chance to look at the uh, AI RMF, uh, trustworthiness, uh, privacy enhances one of the characteristics for the trustworthiness and federated learning again has been mentioned. Uh, in the playbook as one of the way to enhance the privacy. Thank you for that. Next question. The Army Corps have a $52 billion storm surge project to, it will be engaging environmental justice communities, um, AI and machine learning enhance localization of these massive public infrastructure projects. Honestly, I, don't know the answer to that. And that's a good <laughs> question for Army Corps. 52 billion is a large number, and I'm sure that there is a really good governance, and I'm hoping there's a really good governance around that to make sure that this, that project is super successful. Okay, the next question is uh, relates to open uh, code, open AI, uh, and foundation models. How do you anticipate risk management framework affecting the release of foundation models, if at all, there's an increasing debate about how to promote structured access what, rather than open source models, which can uh, have potentially dangerous applications. Yeah, that's also a very good question and quite timely by, uh, you know, release of the chat GPT, right? So I think uh, after the release of the draft one, uh, we got a lot of questions about the utility of the, uh, you know, eventual AI or MF on, Generative AI, and uh, you know, at least at that time, it was large language models. Now, increasingly, they're all becoming multimodal. So I don't even know if large, large language name is, is still fitted for for that that applications. Um, I have two two things to offer for uh, conversations and uh, debate uh, and discussion. Um, first of all, the AI RMF. Uh, again, we follow the wisdom of OECD. And instead of trying to define AI, something that the community cannot has not been uh, able to merge on for the past 60 plus years, is focused on AI systems. So in the first page or second page on early on, it provides a definition of AI systems that uh, talks about uh, computational systems that for a set of objectives produce outputs such as recommendation or, or pred prediction. That definition is general enough to be applied to generative AI or uh, this type of uh, large language models. Uh, at the end, what they are producing is the, their output is sort of a prediction of what a human response could have been. The second thing that I want to bring up is that uh, risk-based approaches are very powerful, not just for AI and you know AI technologies, but in all aspects for understanding um, the negative impact, the, the, the uh, negative consequences, and how to maximize benefits and minimize uh, risks. Uh, knowing that uh, these generative AI systems is within the scope of AI or MF because the definitions is uh, broad enough to uh, include them, and knowing that risk-based approach uh, can be adopted for all of these things, uh, uh, I, I believe that AI or MF will be applicable to those, uh, but uh, we have a section that talks about the challenges in understanding risk and risk management. And I will just say is that the risk profile for these models uh, is gonna be uh, much more complex and complicated than, uh, for example, deep neural network, 
and DNMs are more complicated than logistic regression. So it's just up to us to understand this. And I will add this at last thing that I will bring it in all of my conversations about AI RMF. Uh, the bigger challenge for us as the whole community, particularly the tech community, is to figure out how to do standards and evaluations from a socio-technical lens and approach. Majority of the standards coming out of the ISO and all this that you see are technical specifications. A lot of evaluations that at least us at NIST had done around biometrics or others were evaluations of if the system works, accuracy and validity. Now we wanna evaluate the systems and write standards that not only addresses those, but also the human element, the impact on the human and the harms. And that is where the challenge lies and that is where we need input from all of you and the whole community to figure out how to do that. You're probably familiar with what the Ford Foundation and other foundations have been doing at universities, uh, the Public Interest Technology Network, which is try to get students trained in that and research in that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I, yeah, and I you on how difficult that is, um, just because, yeah. Um, we have a bunch of other questions. I, I, I want to make sure that, okay, people get answered. So here's one that kind of builds on my thinking about this. So this person says, uh, this the RMF is a fantastic governance framework, but it's stops short of being prescription prescriptive about the harms companies should be considering. In other words, like saying directly, here's an example. Uh, well, it does do that to some extent. It's not uh, all of these types of harms that corporations can do. And companies may not have incentives to take these into account. There's no one on the board responsible, or corporate boards responsible for this, corporate governance doesn't include it. So they're not gonna deal with them in their internal risk management procedure. First, do you see this as an issue and how can we tackle that? Corporate governance, if, the answer to tackling that? Yeah. If I understood the question correctly, and if I can rephrase that, and if I that's not the correct one, please let me know. Um, so I, I said AI uh, RMF is a voluntary framework. Uh, that's aligned with, uh, with uh, what NIST is and our mission space, that we are a non-regulatory agency. And I will say it upfront here, that they being non-regulatory was a... Uh, was really important in uh, our ability to build trust with, with the whole community uh, so that when we ask them to come and you know, comment on our documents, we, uh, we hear back from them. Um, so if it's voluntary, and I think that's the question is saying that, okay, you go and put a governance framework out there, you say what to do, but it stops short of being mandatory and required. And if it's all voluntary, where the incentive lies for organizations to do that. Um, that's a good question. And that's a question that uh, is applicable to everything that NIST put out because we, everything we put out is voluntary. Our job is, our job as NIST people is to put out, uh, uh, work with the community to develop uh, appropriate, uh, correct, uh, scientifically valid, technically sound, um, uh, contributions and guidance out uh, for people and, and how it's going to be used is based on the value that it's that's offering. It has been the case with some of the NIST documents, such as the cybersecurity framework that got codified into some certain applications, um, but that is all beyond NIST. Uh, as going back to, to the organizations, um, we, we see this, and I maybe it sounds too optimistic or maybe a little bit naive, but I do believe that uh, it, there is incentives for organizations to do their risk management. There is reputation harm. There is um, there's also, you know, uh, building the conf public confidence in the product and services that they provide to the people. So there, uh, there hopefully is enough uh, market advantage there. So I, I hope that answered the question, but uh, if it was not, and the question was something else, happy to uh, make another try. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, quite a few more questions. Um, how's the EU, I don't know if this is the right question for you, but 
How's the EU revising the GDPR to accommodate uh, Europeans AI strategy uh, to maintain competitiveness? That's probably not something new. Yeah, I, uh, I don't miss. know the, the question, but uh, I know that EU, the proposed uh, EU AI Act and conversations around that, uh, there's a lot going on, conversations through the TTC. Again, you have seen the joint AI roadmap. There's going to be a workshop on February 16. If you hadn't seen the announcement, Susan, I will send it to you if you want to share it with your uh, uh, with the people attending sure. today. Um, that uh, basically is the information session on the joint uh, AI roadmap. And um, the, the GDPR is, um, is, is um, again, one specific uh, risk around data and privacy and AI RMF tries to have a broader, broader uh, agreement. I see a question up about UK Singapore agreement. I'm, I'm I'm not very familiar with that one, but I will just. It, it just that. came out today. It just came. Oh, out. Okay. That was more. I was yapping while we were trying to get you going. Okay. You know, well, kind I just of want to say that we are working with Singapore on doing a crosswalk between AI RMF and AI Verify. The commitment yeah. was made nine months ago, and we have already started working on that. And with UK, we have multiple uh, uh, lines of uh, conversations and hopefully collaborations. I mentioned the US UK privacy preserving uh, price challenges. Uh, but also around the standards hub that they put out, I don't know, a few months ago, and we are also doing a standards hub, trying to make all of them networks of a bigger global uh, standards hub. So, um, yeah. Uh, our next question is, do you see companies like Microsoft and Google aligning their existing AI risk management framework with NIST? So both Microsoft and Google have been uh, participants and contributors to the AI risk management framework. Both companies have been panelists and speakers at our various workshops. Microsoft uh, put their uh, responsible AI document out about, uh, I guess, about a year ago. And uh, we have done a lot of, uh, you know, we had considered, uh, studied that very carefully. They had studied our stuff very carefully. Uh, so uh, my hope is that because they had been um, strong contributors to the AI RMF, and we uh, took uh, all of the comments, including their comments, really uh, into consideration. There are already some alignment, uh, and we will be working on um, better aligning all of those. Okay. Um, so this one is a tough question, too, and if you don't want to answer it, um, that's just fine. The question is, well, we don't have technical specs, you know, shared precise technical specifications, recommendations, guidelines, and even in standards, it seems to have stalled. Why do you think this is so difficult? Yeah, um, it, it, it is, and and the question is fair, right? You know, we uh, when we at NIST starting the cybersecurity framework, um, there were decades of research uh, in the community in standards that we were borrowing from building on top of this. Uh, AI is a rapidly evolving field, right? You know, uh, uh, three years ago, everybody was talking about generative adversarial networks, scans, right? They are completely out today. I mean, so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, moving fast. Uh, that might be one reason. Standards usually happens when there is some stability in the, in the science and then in the market. Uh, that field is, is uh, rapidly evolving. But I will say this too, that this, uh, this socio-technical lens is definitely new for NIST and to my understanding, new for many other entities. Uh, while we, I, I say that in our hundred years or so existence, we perfected the art and science of how to measure error rates in terms of false positive and false negative. Now we are scratching our head that what those false positive, false negative means in the context of AI systems, right? We, we, every, everything is about the tail of the distributions and um, the aggregate measure don't, don't do anything, don't, don't do justice to the measurement of the systems. Um, that, is my, that is my personal take, but, but it's not something that has not been thought of. It's not something that is completely new. It's uh, good, good, good um, 
thinking and good um, attempts are happening all over. I think it's up to us to bring them all together and try to uh, provide answers better and faster. Okay. Um, do you think uh, the risk management framework should be tailored to specific sectors such as financial sector? In other words, uh, a financial sector version of it? Oh, thank you for that question. Yes. Uh, so um, again, one of the another design principle, and I think at the back of the AIRMF, we kept the attributes of the AIRMF. That was what we sort of agreed with the, with the community or community told us, uh, these are the, the attributes we want to see in AIRMF. Technology agnostic, use case agnostic was one of them. We want a framework that is high level. But knowing that, so what it does, it provides, again, those horizontal foundations, a shared understanding of risk, trustworthiness, trustworthiness characteristics, um, all, all, all those. So we have some sort of a uh, uniformity and harmony for different use cases or verticals as we talk about them. Um, we also agree that, again, AI is all about context and use case and how each either of these trustworthy characteristic, characteristics that I, um, the seven elements that I mentioned them, or their trade-offs will manifest themselves in different use cases in financial sector versus hiring versus face recognition would be a little bit different and they may have different priorities. Uh, so we all agree that uh, while providing this horizontal general uh, high level framework is important to actually implement that there is need for a uh, tailored guidance to that specific technology or use case. And we call them AI or MF profiles. Uh, NIST, can, NIST is happy to, to help in development of the AI or MF profile, um, convene or to the extent possible lead, but we truly believe that the, the real lead or the you know the entity on the driver's seat for development of the AI or MF should be groups with the domain expertise. So if you want to do AI or MF for financial sectors, we need to have uh, experts in um, financial sectors to explain how these trustworthy characteristics mean or exist or um, um, is important for, for that particular use case. Um, so one of the Things. I think the third element in the roadmap is development of the AI RMF profile. Uh, we are uh, extremely uh, encouraged and happy and committed to work with the uh, with people that want to develop AI RMF profiles. We call them verticals or or tailored or instantiations of AI RMF for uh, cer certain uh, uh, use cases, specific use cases. Um, already some conversations has started on development of AI RMF for certain applications. And I'll be more than happy to connect you with our team or continue that discussions for development of the profiles. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, this question relates to how we think about the problem of data. and. Uh, the questioner asks, should trust building risk management focus on evaluation of risks of collective harms versus how much law currently does, which is to individual harms? And um, this person then cites his example, uh, Canada's proposed AI and Data Act that focuses on individual harms to the exclusion of collective harms. That is not because we call it privacy law and it doesn't focus on other rights like freedom of speech and freedom of association actively. Yeah, that's, that's another good, good, uh, good question. So again, in design of the AIRMF and writing the AIRMF, we try to do it in a way that all of this are within scope. And I think the first figure in AIRMF talks about harms to individuals and harms to groups. Uh, we usually use the phrase uh, harm to individual groups, communities, or society and planet. Um, and um, I think in the in the de development of the profiles, in the implementation of AI RMF, that these sort of details about harms to individual or collective harms, again, depends on the context, get, get discussed. But uh, the intent for the AI RMF is to be able to allow for all of them. Thank you. OK, uh, next question is, OK, some of Congress have expressed concerns with the blueprint and its differences 
with the risk management framework. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, Thank, thanks for that question. So um, uh, both documents um, pursue the same goal of um, operationalizing values and uh, rights affirming, rights uh, preserving approaches so the technologies are helping people rather than harming people. Um, AI or MF is, uh, is, uh, aims to help and equip organizations to uh, manage AI risks at the time of design, de develop, deploy, or use of AI systems. Uh, and uh, it talks about, as we just talked about it, it talks about uh, you know, many different risks of AI. Uh, the blueprint uh, of AI Bill of Rights um, mostly focuses on one um, type of this uh, uh, rights, one type of this risk, and that is risks to um, human rights and risks to uh, uh, equitable access to opportunities. Um, so in that way, um, maybe a blueprint is more specific about one particular risk and AI RMF is more general about other mm. type of risks. Um, I don't think they are uh, different or, or um, there is any contradiction. Uh, another sort of a difference is that AI RMF, again, uh, the scope of the AI RMF as we talk is AI systems. Uh, for the blueprint, they talk about automated system that can be broader than an AI system. So that's that's another, that's another. So in, in terms of the type of uh, application, uh, the blueprint has a broader scope. It's anything about automated system is part of the scope of the blueprint. With AI RMF, we try to focus on AI systems and even uh, more specifically on the risks unique to AI and any other risks such as cybersecurity, privacy data, as we discussed at the beginning of the call, uh, try to leverage other uh, documents. Um, and uh, it's about all different type of risks or harm that AI systems can, um, uh, can produce. Um, blueprints mostly focus on uh, uh, risks to and, and uh, equitable access and to opportunities. Other than that, I think they, they are, the both documents share the same goal. Uh, we ran a process for development of the AI RMF to be uh, open, transparent, collaborative. OSDP commented uh, like many others on our document. Uh, OSDP ran a process for and collected input. We commented like many other many other entities that had the opportunity to, to comment on that. Alham, that is the end of the questions that we have for right now. And while I have a million questions I'd like to ask you, I know that you have a busy day and a puppy behind you that probably could use some fresh chair <laughs> today. I really want to thank our audience for bearing with us. I very much appreciate your interest in this webinar. And I promise you we're going to drag her back here. Um, and we're going to have a lot more on AI coming up, especially related to digital trade. So thank you to all of our partners in this. And thank you, Alham, and everybody have a great weekend. See you soon. I, I want to thank you uh, for having me on this program. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. Apologies for the uh, technical difficulty at the beginning. And uh, thanks for letting Rainier to be part of that part of the discussion too. Thanks a lot. Wow, you are the Ghostbuster for AI. If you know that movie where it says, who are you going to call Ghostbusters? So the person that you <laughs> thank you is you, Alham. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. See you soon.